distinguish them. But business, uh, government, uh, you know, educational hierarchies, uh, you know, they're always fighting the class war. I mean, every time you look at an advertisement on television, it's class war. It's trying to turn you into a passive consumer. So you, you won't talk to other people and you know, try to figure out something wrong with all of these things. Uh, there's not a moment when you're not engaged in class war. You can decide, you know, you can succumb and say, I'm going to notice it. But it's uh, hitting you every minute of the day down to the infants. I mean, when I watch uh, television with my grandchildren, you know, three-year-old kids, uh, just take a look at what's being presented to them on television. I mean, they're being deeply indoctrinated into passivity, conformism, consumerism, uh, you know, the rejection of conflict, uh, failing. You know, this is just a class war, a constant class war, never stops. So sure, class analysis is important. It's not the only thing that's going on. It's a major problem. And Toby. Having been part of the descent of politics and speaking at events like this since uh, the American invasion of South Vietnam, how have you noticed a change in the reception of yourself and your ideas? Well, um, when I started speaking about the invasion of South Vietnam, for one thing, you couldn't use the phrase. Uh, it, it was years. I mean, in, in, in an educated audience, you still can't use the phrase. Like I was talking at Harvard Graduate School, you know, couldn't use the words, it'd be like talking to Sumerian or something. Uh, because the words don't exist. I mean, have you ever seen it in a newspaper or a scholarly work or anything? I mean, there's no such thing except in the real world. I guess there was such a thing. Uh, so first of all, you can talk about it. Uh, furthermore, the audiences were, uh, I don't know, three or four people in some living room or uh, occasionally be a church where uh, there'd be four people there, you know, the pastor who kindly gave us the church, or the organizer, or a uh, drunk who walked in, <laughs> some other guy who wanted, wanted to murder him. That was a typical audience. Uh, when the uh, anti-war movement began in the early 60s, even close to the mid, like 1964, that late, if we wanted to have a meeting somewhere at, say, a college, we'd have to bring together you know, half a dozen topics. You know, Iran, Venezuela, you know, Brazil, Vietnam, you know, the maybe get 10 people to come out because they're interested in different things. Uh, in fact, uh, it really, I mean, for the first pub in Boston where I live is the most liberal city in the country. They like to call themselves the Athens of America, Harvard, all this kind of stuff. Uh, but uh, it was the center of American liberalism. I mean, the first public meeting against the war was the International Days of Solidarity Against the War. It was October 15th, 1965. And there were demonstrations all around the world. So we figured, okay, we'll try to have an outdoor demonstration in Boston. Scale. And there's a place in Boston, it's Boston Common, which is like the free speech area, sort of Hyde Park. So there was a march down to Boston Common, a couple of speakers, and supposed to be one of the speakers, so, you know, big mobs of counter demonstrators, mostly coming from universities, uh, there to break up the demonstration. Uh, yeah, couldn't get a word out, nobody could be heard. In fact, the only reason we weren't slower was there were a couple hundred state cops around who didn't like what we were saying but didn't want to see people murdered on the Boston Common. <laughs> next day in the newspapers, take a look at the Boston Globe, the most liberal newspaper in the country, uh, the front page, the entire front page was devoted to this uh, and a big picture in front of a wounded soldier. You know, there's a soldier fighting for freedom and uh, the rest of it was all about these uh, county rats trying to undermine our brave soldiers, you know, that kind of stuff. The radio was full of it, you know, there's denunciations. If you go to Congress, uh, the people who later pretended to be, after the war went sour, uh, everybody suddenly be became a long time secret dove, you know, really secret. <laughs> uh, but then a memoir, Kennedy memoir, so we wrote their memoirs and so on. Story, but uh, 
people like uh, the people who later became celebrated as uh, anti-war heroes, Mike Matt Hansfield and others, uh, were denouncing what they called the irresponsibility of the protesters. And, and in a way, they were right because the protests were so mild, it was embarrassing. <laughs> this was kind of literally embarrassing to say the words. This was four years after Kennedy had launched a major war against South Vietnam. And before that war, there were about 70,000 people who had been killed by the U.S. client state. Uh, 61, 62 was when the major war started, the law against the South. But in February 1965, uh, that's when they started bombing the North. And that's what you could protest against, the bombing of the North. And the rest, most of the anti-war movement from that point on was against the bombing of the North. Well, you know, bombing of the North was an atrocity, but didn't come close to what was going on in South Vietnam. Not even close. You know. But that's kind of gone from history. And part of the reason is that the anti-war movement either didn't understand, which is partly largely true, or just couldn't pick it up. Well, that was February 1965. Uh, by that time, there were about 250,000 American troops in South Vietnam rampaging, and the country was almost gone. You know, I mean, it's been totally devastated. Uh, and so it went. To, by 1967 and 68, there was a substantial popular movement, you know, and tens of thousands of people, certainly. Uh, but still, the focus was, mostly in Europe too, the focus was on the bombing of the North. And there's a reason for that. It's not a pretty reason. Uh, the reason is that the attack on South Vietnam was costless for the United States. I mean, just the killing and massacring completely defenseless people. Nobody cares. When he bombed North Vietnam, more dangerous. But for one thing, you're hitting Russian ships at the Haiphong Harbor. Uh, you're bombing a Chinese railroad. Um, the way the French built railroads, the Chinese railroad the people in the south happened to go through North Vietnam. So you start bombing a Chinese railroad, the well, Chinese might react, uh, the Russians might react. If you bomb anywhere near Hanoi, uh, you're bombing European embassies. And they get upset. And furthermore, there are Reporters up there, so they'll go you know, 20 miles around Hanoi and they see villages wiped out, you know, don't like it. Uh, so, bombing the north carried costs, and therefore it was an issue. The bombing the south carried no costs. Uh, and it's striking when you read the declassified, you know, the Pentagon papers are kind of like stolen archives, you get the real story, not what's declassified by the government. And therefore, they're almost ignored by scholarship and by the media, practically ignored. But they're very revealing. For example, one of the things they show is that the bombing of the North was planned in meticulous detail. You know, they really thought about it, how far should we go? I mean, <coughs> take a look at the bombing of the South, it's, it's not even mentioned. You just do whatever you feel like. You know? So, uh, uh, so there's barely any mention of planning you want to target villages with B-52 bombing from them to it and so forth. Uh, and the anti-war movement is responsible for this too because they kept to the same framework of overwhelmingly. Uh, and that's the picture that lasts in history. So the history of the war, that's what it is. Uh, the anti by the late 60s, things really had changed. And a lot of other things have changed too because the, you know, the anti-war movement just kind of integrated with a lot of other things that were going on. Uh, so you, you're barely beginning, beginning to get the beginnings of the feminist movement at that time. And the sources of it, I don't know what it's like here, but in the United States it was very striking to watch. Uh, part of the sources of the women's movement were the sexism of the anti-war movement. Uh, very striking. You can see it. Uh, the, especially the draft resistors. I was working a lot with resistance. And the draft resistors were brave people. You know, 17, 18 year old kids who are facing a real problem, not fun to spend you know, years in jail, go to exile, never get back home. And they felt righteous, you know. And part of the way he felt righteous was by uh, oppressing young women, who then sort of supposed to serve you and admire you and so on. And the women, after a while, started to resent uh, because uh, the general 
typical anarchist sentiments of not being want to be, want to be kicked around were coming up, and that uh, led to a critique of the sexism of the young resistors, which for many of them was a real crisis. I mean, I know some who actually committed suicide because they couldn't deal with it. You know, here's this sense that we're doing something really courageous, and, uh, but we're oppressors, how can we face that? Uh, and that was a good part of where the women's movement came from. The women's movement really didn't develop a major force until the 70s, but it was part of the group. Uh, the environmental movement was barely beginning. The civil rights movement, which is an interesting story, as long as the civil rights movement was focused on you know, hideous uh, sheriffs in Alabama, it was very popular in the North. Yeah. But by the mid-60s, it was shifting to the North. The last couple of years, we just had Martin Luther King did, you know, we celebrate Martin Luther King. What they celebrated is what he was doing in the South. By 1965, he was turning to organizing a poor people's movement, and that's all over the country. And in fact, when he was assassinated, it was at a time when he was in the midst of the speaking meeting the poor people's movement. Well, that's out of, you know, kind of like out, going too far. You know. So when you read about Martin Luther King, they say, well, the last couple of years of his life, he kind of lost direction. You know. <laughs> uh, so you know, it's okay to be self-righteous about Alabama sheriffs, but to not to look at what's happening in your neighborhood. It's the same thing. You know. Uh, but uh, uh, that was be the civil rights movement was beginning to turn into a you know, like a general movement of the poor. It was very frightening to power systems, and uh, but it was going on, and a lot of organizing was going on. There was a lot of craziness. You know. The youth culture was going on in its own way. You know, just revolt, the music, the style of dress, all kinds of things. Uh, but the general effect was extraordinary. I mean, it's, uh, and it's lasting. And the whole country just changed, became just more civilized. And like my own university, MIT, uh, if when around 1960, say, uh, MIT was uh, white males, uh, well dressed, tossing jackets, obedient, <coughs> deferential, did your homework, and so on. If you walk around MIT today, it looks like this. Half women, literally, half women, you know, third minorities, uh, casual dress, uh, informal relationships, you know, to do serious work or serious before, but uh, just totally different. And the same is true all over the country. So, as far as, say, reaction goes, the, you know, educated elite sectors are very more rigid than they were because they were frightened by all of this. The tremendous backlash against them. Liberal com liberalism comes from everything else, all part of the backlash. But among the population, it's just expanded all over. I give a talk in the, in the Idaho Washington border, in a little town where all you see in the town is uh, Christian evangelical posters and you know, National Rifle Association and so on. You know, 4,000 people show up uh, you know, from nowhere, you know, it's around there. Somewhere. And that happens all over. I mean, I spend maybe an hour a night. I spend a lot of time answering email, but uh, probably an hour a night is just turning down invitations, which I really like to accept. Uh, and the, the, there are very few people, unfortunately, who are publicly available. You know, it's not the kind of thing that people, privileged people do. We're all obviously very privileged, but uh, they don't do it. So there are very few people who, who will do these things, and they're just overwhelming demand, and they get the same reaction. I mean, you know, Howard Zinn, I'm sure, who is another one who's on the road all the time, though he's not young, he's older than I am, but uh, he's out there all the time. <laughs> 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 and he's just a garage with invitations, and he gets the same reaction, thousands of people showing up. But, you know, so it's just a tremendous change in the whole country, it just became a lot more civilized. And it, it, you know, a lot of very striking ways.